Oh, so today we are continuing in our series, Good News for Everyday Life. Well, we're thinking together about how we understand and we apply the gospel in our everyday lives. I want to start today by asking you to think about a question. Think about how you would answer this question in your own head. The question is, what do you think of when you think about the gospel, about the good news of Christianity, the Christian message? Maybe for you, the thing you think of when you think of the gospel is about forgiveness of sins. The fact that in the gospel we get totally forgiven, totally washed clean from all the things we've done wrong. Or maybe for you, you think about the gospel and you think about relationship with God. The fact that we are welcomed into, restored back into a relationship with the God who made us and who loved us. Or maybe for you it's the implications of the gospel for our lives. Maybe it's the call to love other people, to treat other people as we want them to treat us. Well, all of these are things that are true about the gospel and its impact on our life. But I think there's something else we often miss when we think about the gospel. Something that actually is really important and really central to understanding the gospel. And we see a bit about this in the book of Acts. Acts is one of the books in the New Testament. It tells us about the first few decades of the early church history as the Christian leaders went out and proclaimed the gospel in the known world. And in Acts 17, there's a really interesting story. Two of the Christian leaders, Paul and Silas, are in a city called Thessalonica, and they proclaim this good news, this gospel. And some people hear them, they hear the message, they respond, and they become followers of Jesus. Other people hear them, they hear the gospel, and they really don't like what's being said and what's going on. And so they drag some of these new Christians up in front of the authorities, and this is what they say in Acts 17. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. I find this story so interesting because these people have heard the gospel preached. They've seen some people respond and become followers of Jesus. And when they then summarise what this message they've heard is, when they're asked, what do you think of when you think of the gospel, they say, Jesus is king. For them, the summary of the gospel they'd heard is that there's another king in competition with Caesar, the emperor of the time. Actually, Jesus is king. And I find that so interesting because I wonder if that's not one of the things we tend to associate with the gospel. And in fact, if we're honest, I think we often see a, a bit of a division, a separation between the kingdom of God and the gospel. We think of the gospel as this equation of good news. It's kind of uh, my sin, my rebellion against God, plus Jesus' death and resurrection equals forgiveness. And that is wonderfully true. But then we think about the, uh, the gospels in the New Testament, the accounts of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. We read them through and we find actually there's not a lot of talk of forgiveness of sins. It is there, but it's not the prominent message. Actually, the big theme in the gospels is about the kingdom of God. And so even as Christians, we can get to this funny situation of asking, well, do the Gospels in the New Testament actually preach the Gospel? Did Jesus in the Gospels actually preach the Gospel as we tend to think about it? Well, I think the Gospels do proclaim the Gospel. And I think Jesus did preach the Gospel. But I think the way they did it helps highlight to us another aspect of the Gospel that we tend to overlook or downplay but an aspect that has big implications for our everyday life, and an aspect which is wonderfully good news. It's the good news that Jesus is king. So let's just explore that question. Did Jesus preach the gospel? Well, I think we can see really clearly he does, and we can see that at the beginning of Mark's gospel. In fact, the very first words Jesus proclaims in this gospel, Mark tells us, are the gospel. And so at the beginning of Mark, Jesus is baptised, He goes into the wilderness and is tempted, and then he comes to begin his public ministry, those few years of travelling and teaching he does. And this is what Mark tells us, starting from verse 14 of chapter 1. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark tells us that Jesus starts his ministry by proclaiming the gospel. And gospel is just a word that means good news. In the ancient world, it was used originally to report military victories that happened far off. Listen up to the gospel of where we've won the victory in some far off land. And then over time, it came to be used for other forms of good news as well. 
Here Mark says Jesus comes onto the public scene and he's proclaiming good news from God. And what's the content of that good news? It's about the kingdom of God, about God's reign. Jesus comes and he says, this is it. Now is the time God's reign is coming. He's saying God is coming to reclaim his position as the unrivaled king. And that's an idea we might find a bit odd. How come God needs to come and reclaim his position as king? Hasn't God always been king? Isn't he the creator and the sustainer and the ruler over all? Don't we read in someone like the Psalms in the Old Testament, that song book in the Old Testament, aren't they constantly proclaiming that God is king? And the answer to all those questions is yes. God has always been king by virtue of, kind of who he is and what he's done. But as we read the Bible, we also find there's a sense in which God's kingly authority has been passed over to another. And we as humanity have put ourselves under another kingly authority. To actually understand that, we have to go right back to the very beginning of the Bible, where God creates everything, creates us, and we are designed to live under God's kingly rule. And it is a life-giving rule. It is the very best thing for us. But the story goes wrong. Instead of trusting God's rule, actually the serpent comes along. And Adam and Eve choose to trust his rule rather than God's rule. The serpent is Satan and he tempts them, misleads them, and they put themselves under his kingship rather than under God's kingship. We as humanity kind of hand over some of the authority to another ruler and we got ourselves stuck in that position. That's why Jesus can call Satan the ruler of this world. Several times in John's Gospel, that's a, a title Jesus uses for Satan. Or Paul the Apostle can speak of him as the God of this world. He's one who blinds our minds. Or in Ephesians, Paul again can say he's the prince of the power of the air. And if we're outside of Jesus, if we're not being rescued by Jesus, we are kind of destined to follow him. And actually the Apostle John, when he writes his first letter, he can say, 1 John 5, 19, we know that we, Christians, followers of Jesus, are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And I think this is something we easily overlook. Perhaps it's something we're very uncomfortable with if we're really honest about. But the Bible is really very clear there is a real evil being called Satan. And that we've allowed him to take some level of authority over us. And until Jesus rescues us out from that position, Satan is ruling over us. This is why Jesus needed to come and why in Jesus God comes to reclaim his position as the unrivaled king. And he explains Jesus' proclamation. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It means Jesus has come. In Jesus coming, God has come. Now is the time when just as he promised all through the Old Testament, he's going to reclaim his position as king. He's going to rescue people out from under the rule of the evil one. And he's going to once again be the unrivaled ruler of all. And how does Jesus do that? Well, he does that supremely through his death and his resurrection. You see, what looks like Satan's greatest victory over God was actually God's ultimate victory over Satan. And Mark wants us to see that as we read his gospel. When you read the account of the death of Jesus in Mark 15, you'll find there's lots of kingly ideas, lots of things about Jesus being a king. Because this is the time when Jesus is reclaiming God's kingship. He's defeating the other ruler and reclaiming his position. So in Mark 15, you find Pilate, the Roman governor who tried Jesus, asking Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And actually two more times in the chapter, Pilate uses that phrase, king of the Jews, to refer to Jesus. When the soldiers are mocking Jesus as he's being taken away to be crucified, they mock him as if he's a king. They put a purple robe on him. The purple is the colour of royalty in the ancient world. They crown him with a crown of thorns, and we're told they began to salute him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And as Jesus is crucified, as he hangs on a Roman cross, the, the notice of the charge against him, which is placed above him, says, The King of the Jews. And here, all these people are, are mocking Jesus. They don't believe this. They think they're having fun of someone who claims to be the king. But actually, if we've read the Gospel of Mark, we're meant to get the huge irony that they think they're mocking him. They think they're having a joke. And actually, they are speaking the total truth. They are proclaiming what is actually happening in that moment, that Jesus is reclaiming his position as king. And so as Jesus dies as our substitute, as our sacrifice, he's winning the victory over Satan, over the ruler of this world. 
The New Testament kind of explains this elsewhere. Paul the Apostle in Colossians 2 tells us that in this death of Jesus, God disarmed the rulers and authorities, that spiritual powers, Satan and his minions, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. Or the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2, tells us that Jesus had to become just like us, had to take on humanity, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil. In his death, and then his resurrection, his ascension, his going back to be God, with God the Father, Jesus triumphs over Satan. He reclaims his position as king, and he gains the authority to rescue people from out under the, the deathly destructive rule of Satan and to bring them in under the life-giving rule of God into the kingdom of God. In Jesus, just as he had said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God draws near. This is the good news that Jesus came to proclaim and to enact in his death, his resurrection and his ascension. And this means that right now, Jesus is king. You know, he rose from the dead and 40 days later, he ascended. He went up to be with God the Father. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning. But this, that's true now, but this is also a time of waiting. Jesus has won the decisive victory, but he's not yet implemented it in full. We're waking, waiting for the day when he does that. Because there's a day coming when that happens. You can read about this in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15. He says that Jesus right now is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God, waiting for everything to be put under his feet. And there's a day that is coming when Jesus will come back. Everything will be put in subjection to him. And then Jesus, God the Son, will hand this kingdom over to God the Father, and God, Paul tells us, will be all in all. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Christianity, is that Jesus is king. So that's an understanding a bit more of what the gospel, one of the aspects of the gospel. But then what about how does that impact us? How is this good news for everyday life? How should this impact us and the way we live? Well, actually, Jesus helps us here. Because you might have noticed in those verses from Mark, Jesus calls us to respond to what he says. He proclaims the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is ha at hand, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on, repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is good news that demands a response. It's not the kind of thing you can hear and just kind of leave. It demands a response. It's so important, it's so serious, such a big claim. We have to choose how we're going to respond. And Jesus tells us here the right response is repentance and belief. And repentance and belief actually are both the entry point into the kingdom, but also the lifestyle we live out when we're living in the kingdom. So the entry point to the kingdom, for people who aren't yet followers of Jesus, the way we come into the kingdom of God, the way we are freed and rescued from the destructive rule of the evil one and brought into the life-giving rule of God is through repentance and belief. Repentance is about turning, turning 180 degrees. It's a choice to turn away from our rejection of God, our rejection of Jesus' kingship. It's a choice to recognise we've not allowed Jesus to be king in our own lives. We've let other things be king and we choose to turn away from that. And then when we turn, we turn to belief. That's like the other side of the coin, if you will. We're turning to believe that Jesus is king that he rose from the dead, he defeated Satan, he's now ruling and reigning. And we're believing, we're also, we could say, trusting. We're trusting in the promise Jesus made that anyone who repents, who turns and believes and trusts in him, anyone will be rescued, saved, be brought into God's kingdom. The fact that Jesus is king is good news because it comes with this invitation that we get to come into this life-giving rule. We can live under it, and the way we enter into that rule, into that kingdom, is through repentance, turning, and through belief. It's the entry point to the kingdom, but actually also these same two things are the very lifestyle of the kingdom. They are meant to characterise our lives as followers of Jesus. Repentance is so important in the Christian life, that turning back to Jesus, because we, if we're honest, find it so easy to put other things in Jesus' place. So easy to allow other things to become the king, the controlling power, the thing we're living for. It might be our career. It might be relationships. 
possessions, even ourselves, we can become our own kind of kings in that way. But repentance is about choosing to stop, to recognise that, and to turn, to reorientate our hearts towards Jesus and to submit ourselves to him again as king. Repentance should characterise Christian life, but so should belief, the thing that we actually turn to. Christian life should be about growing in our believing and experiencing the fact that Jesus is king. Christian life should be about submitting every single part of our lives to Jesus' kingship, surrendering every part to him. This believing also helps us to live with real amazing peace. Because we can know that no matter what's happening, what's happening, Jesus is king and we're living under his life-giving rule. And that brings incredible peace. And also this brings hope. You see, there's hope because no matter what's happening, even living through a pandemic as we are right now, we know this isn't the end of the story. We know it's a time when Jesus comes back, everything's put under his feet, he gives the kingdom to the Father, God will be all in all. And we, if we are a follower of Jesus, will live for all eternity under God's perfect life-giving rule. This is wonderfully, wonderfully good news for us. Maybe for you today, you need to do some of this. Maybe there's some stuff you need to repent for. Maybe even as I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is highlighting to you things that you've allowed to become king in your own heart. Things that have taken preference over Jesus. But let me tell you, there is no other king you can find who will uh, do a better job at giving you fullness of life than Jesus can. There is nothing else that you can live for, no one else you can live for, who will do such lasting good to you. Are there things that today you need to repent from, turn away from, which have become king in your life? And do you today need to be deliberate about believing afresh, Jesus is king and there's parts of my life I need to submit to him? Maybe for you it's, I'm just wrapped by anxiety and stress and worry. And as I think you're gently speaking to yourself, Jesus is king. I can have peace. Maybe it's just thinking, what is going on in the world? Maybe thinking, what's going on in your life? Maybe for you it's reminding yourself, Jesus is king. There is hope because we know what's coming at the end of the story of Jesus' kingship. So I think this is a hugely overlooked element of the gospel. But it's wonderfully, wonderfully good news. Jesus is king. In his death, he won a decisive victory over Satan. The cross was a place of defeat, but it was the defeat of Satan, not the defeat of God. And right now, Jesus is king. And he invites us to come to him for rescue from under the power of Satan, to enter his kingdom, enter under God's life-giving rule, and there to live and enjoy life with him as we wait for that day when he comes back. The kingdom uh, is given to God the Father. God the Father becomes all in all and we get to live with him forever. And he once again is the truly uncontested king of all. And that demands a response from us. Maybe we're engaging with this today and we're not a follower of Jesus. Jesus says the right response is repentance and belief. Turning away from other things, turning to him. Maybe we are a follower of Jesus. For us it's living a Christian life, following Jesus in a way which is characterised by repentance, keeping on orientating our heart back to him and by belief, seeking to grow in the experience of the fact that Jesus is king. Let me just leave you today with the kind of the challenge of the invitation. In what way and where do you need to repent of things? Where do you need to believe, believe afresh that Jesus is king and apply that to your life? Let me just pray for us as we kind of come to a close. Look, God, we thank you that you are king. Thank you, Jesus. You came and in your death and your resurrection and your ascension, you have won the decisive victory over the evil one. Thank you. You had the power to rescue us out from under his destructive rule and to bring us into the life-giving rule of God. And I pray today, Lord, for each one of us, please help us to listen to you and to respond to that good news. Please help us to repent, to turn away from other things we've allowed to become kings in our lives to turn away from them and to turn to you, to submit every part of ourselves to your life-giving rule, to choose to live your way and to have the peace that comes from knowing your king, to have the hope that comes from knowing your king. Holy Spirit, I pray, please just work in us. Help us, even as we take bread and wine in a moment, help us to do these things, to turn our hearts to you, to do business with you and to celebrate and enjoy this wonderfully good news, I pray. Help us to do it with this, we ask. Amen.